Hey, this is Zengo MD. We're going to talk a lot about PRP here called platelet rich plasma, and it really represents the most exciting new frontier of aesthetic medicine for the next decade, maybe longer. This video is where you should start learning about PRP before moving to our other PRP videos. I first learned about PRP for cosmetic use back in 2013. I wrote the first ever CME approved training course in cosmetic PRP for practical CME medical training back in 2014 and have seen this exciting new area of cosmetic medicine grow in the years since then. Still few people know exactly what PRP is. A lot of people call PRP something that is not platelet-rich plasma. It's substandard. So we need to learn about how it's made and what it can and cannot do, and this video is the starting point. So let's go on ahead and give you some of the big facts and the mechanism of action about how this bioidentical treatment for your skin actually works. Well, as our faces age, a few things are universal. While we may gain weight in our hips, thighs, and abdomen, our face loses fat and begins to fall under the influence of gravity. This deflation, coupled with ultraviolet light exposure over decades, leads to these changes of aging. Wrinkles at rest and in motion, which can be treated with hyaluronic acid dermal fillers and botulinum toxin, but neither can actually turn back the clock by stimulating new tissue. They wear off and they have to get repeated. What if we had a natural substance that could do that? This is what aging of the skin looks like under the surface. When we lose volume and the resistance against gravity, what we're really saying is that the structural fibers of the skin, collagen and elastin, are diminished and not getting replaced as quickly as when we were younger. Add to that a drop off in the hyaluronic acid matrix that gives us volume to the dermal layer and the loss of the subcuticular fat underneath that gives volume and cushioning. Again, except for temporary replacement of hyaluronic acid dermal fillers, and Botox do not do anything to help regenerate new lasting structure to the skin. The key player here is the fibroblast or the stem cell of the skin. It's capable of producing collagen and elastin fibers that give your skin structure, thickness, uniformity, stretch, and resistance against gravity. They also replenish hyaluronic acid, but they start to underproduce as we age. Also adipose derived stem cells in our fat are responsible for maintaining that layer of cushioning. So where can we get more fibroblasts from, or at least find the fuel that makes those fibroblasts run their best? That brings us to platelets. These little blue dots on this blood smear, platelets make up less than 1% of your blood, and most people think that they're mainly responsible for allowing your blood to clot, which is true, but these little guys actually mediate the entire healing and repair process. Nothing else in your blood does this, and when platelets become activated, as you see here, when they get all spiny, this happens when they sense an injury and they release growth factors that stimulate those fibroblasts and fat cells to get the job done. But the inactive platelet has these growth factors hiding inside alpha granules. Substances like PDGF, IGF, EGF, and others stay in those little granules until needed. And as you see here, they all do a great job stimulating fibroblasts and circulation to an area. So the next question you might ask is, do platelets when injured really release large amounts of these growth factors. Here's a landmark study from 2008 that really showed what PRP can do. Here you see the huge amounts of fresh growth factors expressed when you concentrate the platelets into a substance called platelet-rich plasma, PRP, and then activate it to release the contents of the granules. Here you see a 140 times increase in the PDGF compared to plain whole blood as it's drawn from your vein and 100% difference for TGF. There is no other way to safely get these growth factors except from your own freshly drawn blood, spun properly, and then activated. You can't just buy them, and why would you want to if you have a fresh source of them all the time, and they're basically free? But does taking this stuff called PRP with all of these fresh growth factors and adding it to the skin really stimulate the fibroblasts? And from the same study, the answer again is yes. Easily a two to seven times greater stimulation of fibroblasts compared to whole blood. And we know that stimulating fibroblasts is what we need to turn back the clock on aging in our face. After all, how else can you increase the number of fibroblasts in the skin as we age? I don't know of a way. It's almost like activated PRP is truly like a fertilizer for the aging face. And like fertilizer, the effects are slow but measurable and treatments will need to be repeated periodically over time. And so this process of drawing blood, spinning, and isolating PRP, activating it, and then using it, either topically or injected into the face, is quite promising. The good traits of PRP are really good. First, it's natural and it's yours. No worry about getting a disease from the preparation. It's always fresh. We never store it. 
Just draw some blood and use it immediately. It's also not a drug, so no unpredictable side effects and no drug company to profit 50% off of the substance from every treatment. And that makes it a lot more affordable and able to do on a regular basis. Finally, there's never been a negative report, toxicity or side effects in the over 20 years of use for other non-cosmetic indications like uses in orthopedics, in joints, burns, and in hair transplants. It simply cannot create an abnormal shape or an abnormal healing response. And it even goes well when mixed with FDA approved hyaluronic acid dermal fillers. So there's a lot of good in PRP, but what about the bad? Really the only bad things about PRP are the unknown still. We still don't know what the optimal dose of PRP is for the best effect at each age. And we don't definitively know what the best duration or interval between treatments is. Finally, the ugly of PRP. And that usually comes with human error and inadequate training. We'll cover this in more depth in another video, but most of the PRP isolation equipment sold, yeah, I said most, that's greater than 50%, is either not FDA approved or it does not isolate the platelets as well as they did in these studies. Meaning what you are getting is something diluted by 50% or more. Many clinics do not understand the importance of activation of PRP either to release those growth factors. And you just saw it in plain uh, sight in that study. In fact, I've gone up to people who are speaking at conferences as experts on PRP, and they've never read the study that I just showed you. And finally, it's definitely ugly to overpromise and underdeliver, like injecting PRP for hair growth, but choosing a man who's been completely bald for a decade. Come on now, it doesn't work in every single situation. So stay tuned and learn more if you're a good candidate for PRP and how you can be the best consumer for PRP. And by the time you finish the videos, you might even know more than every provider in your community who thinks they know what PRP is and how to use it. So stay tuned. Thanks for watching. Bye.